Hello and welcome to this latest edition of the A Material World Lecture Series at the Warburg Institute. I'm Louisa McKenzie, one of the organisers of the series, alongside my colleague Rembrandt Doutz. Tonight we are delighted to welcome Dr Ben Jackson to talk to us. Dr. Jackson is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the John Rylands Research Institute at the University of Manchester. His research focuses on the social, cultural and material histories of gender in, the 18th, in 18th century Britain. His first book, Some Material from which we're going to hear him talk about tonight, is Material Masculinities, Men and Goods in 18th Century England. This examines the material culture and consumer behaviour of middling and elite men between 1660 and 1832, and will be published by Manchester University Press in 2025. His current postdoctoral project explores the social, professional and masculine identities of Anglican clergymen in Britain, Europe and the British Empire between 1660 and 1800. Ben, would you like to share your screen? Yes, thank you, Louisa. Um, hopefully, That's perfect. perfect, brilliant. OK, and um, I shall get started. Um, firstly, I would like to thank and Rembrandt for inviting me to speak this evening and for everyone giving up their Tuesday afternoons to hear some of my current research. Um, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes um, with hopefully plenty of time then for Q&A and discussion. So the title of my talk today is Masculine Discernment and 18th Century Accessories, Snuff Boxes, Canes, Toothpick Cases and Pocket Seals. I just want to start off with a quick language warning. At about 25 minutes into this paper, I will use a quote from the Tatler published in 1709 that does contain an ableist slur. Um, the reason why I've kept it in and, and chosen to use this language is because the word has a very specific meaning around a form of disability in the 18th century that was not problematic then, but is now. Um, I've censored it on the slide. I will not say it, but I just wanted to draw your attention to it before I began. Um, so my paper today um, is, as Louisa said, um, really taken from a chapter of my um, forthcoming monograph. The book examines 18th century men and their possessions, and it thinks about how material goods were useful and indeed central to men's understanding of themselves, performing gendered social identities and exercising forms of gendered power. In doing so, the book really thinks materially about the gender power relations in 18th century Britain. And another aim of the book is also to center men and really masculinity as a process within the product innovation narrative of the 18th century's consumer and industrial revolutions. So I shall begin properly. The 18th century consumer was faced with an unprecedented and dazzling array of new, luxurious and innovatively manufactured products. In the consumer revolution's nascent marketplace of print advertising and the English abolition of sumptuary laws, exclusive luxuries quickly became accessible necessities. This consumer culture intensely debated standards of beauty and material discernment with concerns surrounding the social hierarchy, public morality, military might, and economic efficiency. And these debates congregated around expressions and languages of taste. Small accessories, such as snuff boxes, canes, toothpick cases, and pocket fobs, emerged in the 18th century as fashionable goods and were possessed by people across the social strata. 18th century writers associated these new accessories with women, supposedly, undiscerning and rational consumer desires, particularly for textiles and for porcelain. Thus, British anxieties surrounding the import of continental effeminacy since the mid 17th century manifested in a succession of character types such as the fop, bow, macaroni, and dandy. And I've got two examples here for you. So first is uh, Collie Sibber, 
as Lord Foppington, a famous uh, uh, character of um, the Restoration stage. And then finally, this, this later in 1818 um, print with, you might be able to make out the two gentlemen at the front in the blue and the yellow are taking a pinch from a, um, a snuff box together. These characters' fashionability transgressed the rational, manly ideal. Likewise, the nabob manifested the anxieties over Asian products and newly acquired imperial wealth flowing into Britain. Prolific writers on luxury characterised men's ownership of baubles and jujaws, the names were given in the 18th century for these small trinkets, as foolishly boppish. And while such accusations abound in printed materials, they rarely appear in the manuscript archive. In The Spectator, in 1711, Addison and Steele's bow were, quote, loading with such a redundance of excrescences, such as snuff boxes and the like female ornaments. As male macaroni fashion emerged in the 1770s, an explosion of satirical prints, plays, polemics, and poems on the macaroni appeared. In Matthew Darley's extensive series of macaroni satires throughout the 1770s, the garish snuff box, thin cane, toppling wig, and minute tat composed the macaroni's costume. This evening, I'm going to focus on two key themes that I explore in my chapter on taste, discernment, and accessories. The first is novelty culture, and the second is possession. Now, huge amounts of historiographical ink has been spent on thinking about the new goods in 18th century England, and historians have increasingly become attuned to how these new goods animated gender identity and experience. Much of my book project seeks to move the history of 18th century gendered materiality away from this cultural approach of studying representations of men and new goods in the print marketplace. Nevertheless, I do want to spend some time this evening asking what was it about these objects and their novelty that made them so problematic to 18th century writers? The second is to think about how the actual possession of these objects in 18th century Britain, thinking about the material qualities of these objects to understand selfhood and status in gendered terms. In the book chapter, I also examine men's personalization of these possessions, as well as their use in the creation of effective and social bonds. And if people are interested in, I can certainly talk much more about that in the Q&A at the end. So men's cultural tastes became, a, men's consumer tastes became a cultural battleground upon which socially conservative concerns and anxieties over luxury's potentially perilous aberration of the masculine ideal were fought out. Beyond this moral panic, the discerning male consumer sought out these goods for their ingenuity and technological innovation. Accessories spoke to who you were as a consumer and by extension, how you thought of yourself and how you expressed yourself to others in an increasingly consumerist society shaped by enlightenment ideals of progress and improvement. They're so obviously an expression of one's personhood because they are kept about one's person. And yet we know very little about these accessories beyond their embattled position in the 18th century luxury debates. And these goods, I argue, became central to practices of all male homosociability, gift exchange, ideas surrounding political reform, and practices of emotional network building. They spoke particularly to the personal, to the sensory and the embodied experiences of men and women in 18th century England. And in arguing this, I want to kind of position discernment as something that is personal, embodied and sensory, as well as something that is rational. Many in the 18th century back a second. Many in the 18th century thought the possession and production of new luxury goods spoke to the new modern age, refined tastes, civility and progress. Taste then was not a subjective set of preferences, how it is often used to describe material and consumer 
choices today, but a mechanism of social distinction. For the Earl of Shaftesbury, a prominent early 18th century theorist of taste, taste was an innate mental faculty or sense, refined and cultivated through a polite and enlightened education, and demonstrated in men's manners, conversation, and discerning material acquisition. Historians' examination of the rise of the polite and commercial classes in the 18th century found that who had taste and who could define it increasingly expanded across the period. At the beginning of this century, only a narrow few defined and possessed good taste. Shaftesbury thought elite men could determine and exhibit good taste, and he associated manliness with a rational, stoic disregard for novelty and fashion. Men's taste was, supposedly, wholly superior to the whims of women and the vulgar. Although, over the course of the 18th century, writers increasingly acknowledged women's, provincial elites, and the middling sort's tasteful discernment, and taste was thus becoming increasingly democratised. And it is in this democratisation of taste and what is tasteful that such kind of vociferous attacks on people's consumer choices is taking place. But taste was but one word in a wide lexicon of discerning material choices. Maxine Berg's study of 18th century luxury and pleasure found consumers prize products, quote, ingenuity, novelty and quality when purchasing and displaying their possessions. Small luxurious goods evoke delightfully modern technological wonder within an enlightenment culture of scientific progress. And my purpose here is to build on much of Berg's discussion of the materiality of luxury consumption, but to think more critically about what it was about these objects themselves that charged them with this associational power. Taking snuff and snuff boxes themselves could arguably express the ideologies behind the delights of novelty culture writ large. Arriving in England in the mid 17th century, snuff ground tobacco became the dominant mode of tobacco consumption by the close of the 18th century. It was a huge part of Britain's imperial trade. Modes of tobacco consumption became gendered and this stemmed from the differences in how and where tobacco was consumed. Pipe smoke, as Will Tullett has observed, was associated with the masculine homosocial spaces, such as the coffee house, tavern, and the dining room. And we can see quite clearly here that all members of um, Hogarth's um, A Midnight Modern Conversation are holding these long, thin pipes. Whereas in heterosocial environments, like Vauxhall Gardens, the visual and olfactory invasion of masculine tobacco smoke was an affront to polite and refined mixed heterosociability. At a dinner hosted by the Duke and Duchess of Bridgewater in June 1762, guests who smoked after dinner were, quote, coy and disconcerted together with half a grain of shame and would not willingly have exhibited before the female spectators. This, um, I have another example here of um, this kind of mi refined mixed sociability, the, the tea table as, you know, the centre of polite conversation and sociability in the 18th century. And we clearly see here um, this officer handing um, over to the ladies a, a pinch of snuff. This new fashionable commodity needed new fashionable containers. Delightful novelty was not only evident in Snuffbox's contents, but also found in new material mediums, their new decorative details, and new processes of production. A mid-century Battersea white ground enamel Snuffbox held at the British Museum has the calendar for 1759 decorated onto its lid. The lid's interior is inscribed with a French love song, to music. Novelty is also apparent in the snuffbox's material medium. A new ceramic production technique, Battersea enamel was perceived to be imitative of German Messen porcelain ware. Battersea enamel was made from soft white ground enamel 
and covered in copper. But Battersea is most notable for its high quality transfer printing, hence why you can have such intricate and delicate designs on them on a large scale. Such improvement in transfer printing techniques enabled the Battersea warehouse to produce high quality and intricately printed enamelware that was eagerly sought out by consumers at a much lesser cost than Messon or Sevra. The Snuffbox's decorative features were transposed from printed pocket diaries come almanacs, such as Bell's Edition or the Polite Repository, that contained the New Year's songs and fashionable dances, a list of peers and MPs, and important dates in the social and religious calendar. Like small snuff boxes, pocket diaries were designed to be carried in the keeper's pocket. Both snuff boxes and pocket diaries were produced within and marketed to an increasingly competitive marketplace of goods designed around seasonality. In August 1771, Horace Walpole wrote to Lady Ossery from Paris that, quote, As to snuff boxes and toothpick cases, the vintage has entirely failed this year. I have not been able to find a new one of either sort. Retailed by London enamelist Anthony Tregent, the Canada snuff box, as Walpole's letter neatly illustrates, is indicative of the imitation of products, design qualities and features, and the tapping into of existing consumer crazes. There is here a kind of a ecology of design between these objects. The snuff box decoration, like the ephemeral pocket diaries printed format, signaled that its intended function would be redundant at the dawn of a new year. Obsolescence was built into these objects designs and was part of their consumer appeal. And it is perhaps this sense of wastefulness or profligacy that angered so many of those anxious about the nation's tastes for novel luxuries. Yet the shared decorative features of this calendar snuff box and pocket diaries suggest that the habitual and ritualized taking of snuff connected the snuff box, its decoration, and its fine contents with its user, with its, the person of the user, much in the same way as the diary, its format, and its written contents connected the object with its owner and the ritual of life writing. Accordingly, the feverish writing of the self and the addictive quality of snuff encouraged return and repetitive consumption of snuff, bo snuff boxes and pocket diaries. For Amanda Vickery, the use of 18th century printed pocket diaries were managers of their owners' time, tasks, and social relations. They, quote, asserted individual consumers as more than mere persons, but fully fledged personages. Will Tullet charts the popularity of snuffing as a more personal, individualized form of tobacco consumption alongside the rise of the modern individual self. My question here then is, how can we read the calendar snuff box in the context of 18th century selfhood and novelty? These objects had an entwined relationship with the possessor's sense of self and hints that the 18th century individual self was dependent on things to be meaningful. And why this was so problematic, I think, is that this dependency contravened the ideal of an independent masculinity, because the, it is a masculinity dependent on material things to be meaningful and expressible. So with new modes of consuming and containing tobacco, new social practices and rituals surrounding the snuff box appeared. Snuff taking was a heavily choreographed performance of social etiquette, as Charles Lilly's advertisement in The Spectator in 1711 neatly demonstrates. The exercise of the snuff box, according to the most fashionable airs and motions, in opposition to the exercise of the fan, will be taught with the best plain or perfumed snuff at Charles Lilly's perfumer at the corner of Beaufort buildings in the Strand. 
Attendance given for the benefit of the young merchants about the exchange for two hours every day at noon except Saturdays. There will be likewise taught the ceremony of the snuff box or rules of offering snuff to a stranger, a friend or a mistress according to the degrees of familiarity or distance with an explanation of the careless, the scornful, the politic and surly pinch and gestures proper to each of them. This is quite a famous um, advertisement in the history of snuff and tobacco consumption in, in Britain. And many have used it to argue that snuff taking was an effeminizing fashionable practice. However, this perhaps overemphasizes the risk the snuff box posed to dominant modes of masculine behavior. This is a potentially satirical advert, which is explicitly masculinizing the ceremony of the snuff box in opposition to the femininity of the fan. And it specifically situates snuff and the snuff box within the all male spaces of the coffer house and the exchange. Lily's advertisement sought out those aspiring merchants and traders unschooled in the ways of polite society's material sociability. Whether the art of taking snuff was an affectation or a requirement of polite society, the 18th century's obsession with taste placed considerable value on the meanings behind social interactions between things and people, which was read as a marker of refined status and cultivation. Delicacy and refinement were, for example, required of both men and women when opening a delicate, small and narrow uh, snuff box made from fine materials such as porcelain, tortoiseshell or silver and contain fine powdery contents that easily spills and blows away. As Lord Chesterfield, you know, a famous writer on, on manly tastefulness, writes, the very accoutrements of a man of fashion are grievous encumbrances to a vulgar man. Potentially inept, haptic interactions with such trinkets could expose their possessor's vulgarity or reveal their refinement. And this potential to both expose or reveal refinement or vulgarity is also seen in discussions of canes. Canes became a fashionable accoutrement of the cosmopolitan gentleman by the late 17th century. To many early 18th century commentators, the use of a cane was an effeminate affectation an exemplative of luxury's very real debilitation of the idealized male form. Men's reliance on a cane certainly contravened the normative ideals of physical strength and independence which determined 18th century manliness. Polemicists were particularly critical of the affectation of carrying a cane on a string looped through a waistcoat button rather than using it to aid mobility. In the Tatler in 1709, Steele writes of recent modish male infirmities such as blindness, limping and lisping. He writes, the blind seem to be succeeded by the lame and a jaunty limp is the present beauty. I think I have formerly observed a cane is part of the dress of a prig and always worn upon a button for fear he should be thought to have an occasion for it or to be steamed really and not genteelly. I know no foundation for their behaviour. Without it, it may, be, it may be supposed that in this warlike age, some think a cane the next honour to a wooden leg. And this attack on male fashion is bound up in complex attitudes towards 18th century disability, particularly mobility impairments such as, quote, lameness. Whilst 18th century commentators were sympathetic to the soldier who was injured through his heroism in battle, they were less compassionate to those physically impaired by birth or accident. The affectation of Steele's peaceable invalids was therefore doubly problematic, an insult to the heroism of those injured on battle and a dangerously ironic adoption by men of wealth and fashion of a physical impairment 
many perceive to be the psychological product of low moral and social status. The affected superiority of wearing one's cane upon a button changed the perception of a walking stick from a necessity to an accessory. And in doing so, the cane became an object of affected male fashion and luxurious ornament. 18th century culture grounded the idealized body in prescriptions of manly strength that was of reproductive, economic, social, and national utility. Therefore, in Steele's eyes, pretty fellows were corrupted by fashion, and in turn, fashion disabled the male body and the body politic. And this is much more to do with making comparisons between men rather than been making comparisons between women. Men could be unmanly by virtue of their affectations, but that did not make them effeminate per se. And it's important to kind of pause here to, uh, that there is some debate over what effeminacy means in the 18th century. I understand or I approach effeminacy as a social failing, not as kind of sexual transgression of kind of normative uh, heterosexuality. And, and that's kind of how I think it's being used in these sources. Steele writes in The Spectator that whilst foolish young men use snuff boxes and canes as the usual helps of discourse of other young fellows, there was a new breed of young men who used a piece of ribbon, a broken fan or an old girdle, which they play with while they talk of the fair person remembered by each respective token. Here snuff boxes and canes are masculine and are vehicles to either encourage rational, masculine conversation or used as roguish trophies to boast of romantic conquests. Either way, here the expression is about masculinities that do not conform to a gentlemanly polite ideal. So an expression of that kind of um, effeminacy as a form of social failing. The association between effeminacy and canes continued throughout the 18th century. In the Gentleman's Magazine in 1731, a group of fashionable young men were described as a parcel of spruce powdered foplings with their hair tucked under a tortoiseshell comb, their sleeves sliced up above their elbows, a gold headed cane in one hand, an agate box in the other, with a nose full of snuff and a head full of nothing. And this is really to do with the 18th century's obsession with polite conversation and polite conversability being an important characteristic of the cultivated 18th century gentleman. It was, for example, the ultimate display of an elite liberal education based in Latin, Latin and rhetoric. And if fashionable gentlemen's accoutrements were therefore trifling affectations, these objects were antithetical to prescriptions of seemingly easy, unrehearsed, polite conversability. The gentleman's magazine's fops, bedecked with snuff boxes and other ornaments, outward and material magnificence could not detract from or mask their inner void. And one thing I want to point out here is that there is an anxiety around the ever-expanding accoutrements that can be seen. So in The Spectator, in The Tatler, in The Gentleman's Magazines and so on, it was both the newness and the proliferation of these personal accessories that created this anxiety. Lord Chesterfield, for example, would only provide his son with the money for one handsome snuff box and one handsome sword and refused to provide with the profusion of a rape. And it's here... Equally important that he is making a distinction um, around handsomeness. So handsome being something in the 18th century that is either easy to handle or it is um, elegantly dignified. Those are the sorts of words associated with handsome. Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments was perplexed that lovers of toys would walk about loaded with a multitude of baubles of which the whole utility is certainly not worth the fatigue of bearing the burden. 
good taste then for these men was as much about restraint as it was about refinement. Not only could these fine accoutrements not hide men's lack of intelligence, they could work to expose their unpolished vulgarity. Like many of his Whiggish counterparts, Chesterfield was anxious about who the supposed ornaments could expose. He wrote that the vulgar man is at a loss with what to do with his hat when it is not on upon his head. His cane, if unfortunately he wears one, is at perpetual war with every cup of tea or coffee he drinks, destroys them first, and then accompanies them in their fall. The vulgar man's fear of his own sword, much like Steele's peaceable invalids, was a criticism of the effeminizing power of luxuries, accessories, upon long-standing ideals of male chivalry and martial heroism. Despite the similar criticisms, Chesterfield was more concerned with fashionable accoutrements as an expression of taste, and taste as the product of elite cultivation. What Chesterfield is most anxious about, though, is that this new, ever-growing multitude of accessories created and presented a plethora of opportunities for the polite, gentlemanly mass to slip and reveal the unpolished diamond beneath. The new practices and performances surrounding new goods were themselves a performance of one's refined manners, civility and good taste. Knowledge of fashions, etiquettes and behaviours was a socially conservative performance of one's access to and knowledge of the beau monde. The more accoutrements a fashionable man about town wore increased the performances and choreographies of elite male status he had to learn, and more importantly, the chances for social encounters to go awry. Possessing a garish, outmoded or dishevelled snuff box, offering poor quality snuff, or offering snuff in the wrong way to the wrong person, taking snuff at the wrong time and in the wrong place, wearing a cane upon your button, not both think, knocking both you and your conversing partner with your wayward cane, or breaking furniture, were all many examples that could inspire social ridicule and commentary. These possibilities therefore posed problems for the self-assured, cultivated, easy and refined polite man these writers wished to promote. That is the kind of the first section, which is in its sense a very kind of um, familiar history of male fashionability um, that has been well documented, um, although there has been less discussed about ideas around the objects themselves. What I want to do now is really take a bit more of a social approach and the historian faces really a problem here and how to move beyond questions of gender, taste, luxury and refinement in these contexts. As national museum collections often preserve the extraordinary rather than the ordinary mundane stuff of everyday life, this poses a particular set of problems for a social historian of material culture. And to excavate the significance of these accessories for men and women Beyond effeminacy, historians need to explore a more diverse selection of source material to which this paper now turns. And so I'm going to walk you through um, a set of samples of thefts of snuff boxes, canes, and toothpick cases from the Old Bailey um, between 1680 and 1820. The proceedings, admittedly, provides only a partial view of accessory ownership. It is a commercial endeavour and therefore only includes kind of noteworthy trials. And indeed, we might not get try, uh, we might not get to snuff boxes that were stolen, um, but because their value was too little, there was no kind of criminal prosecution of them. Of course, the proceedings is London centric and therefore can't provide an, a national picture. And there are two problems with thinking about what the proceedings can give us about how, where, and why um, these um, accessories were bought. But these uh, published court records are intensely useful, as hopefully I will show. The first is that we're able to demonstrate 
a, a large amount of change over time, seeing what sort of patterns are emerging over, in this instance, a 140 year period. Because people had to claim their objects if they were presented in court, they often provided quite detailed description of their goods, kind of material qualities, and indeed sometimes their relationship to them. They have to state a value because that determines the kind of the outcome um, and the punishment um, if they are found, if the um, that thief is found guilty. Uh, and often what emerges in lots of these, um, uh, what emerges in lots of these uh, printed court records is discussion about the spaces and places in which thefts are happening. And so, you know, where these people are using it and, and what that means. Um, so I'm going to start with the snuff boxes. So in this 140 year sample, there were 316 snuff boxes allegedly stolen, either from someone's person or from their home or place of work. The sample demonstrates that snuff boxes were relatively uncommon in London between 1680 and 1710. There were only seven instances of thefts reported, but that grew year on year. There were nine instances of snuff box thefts between 1710 and 1720, compared to 45 between 1811 and 1820. The evolution in the material snuff boxes were made from stands as a testament to the innovation in British decorative arts across the long 18th century. Whilst only one known material, brass, was recorded between 1680 and 1690. In the 1780s, 11 different materials were recorded from traditional gold and silver to exotic lapis lazuli and new enamel. The sample I found includes 316 snuff boxes made from 30 different specified materials. There was mother of pearl, tin, paper mache, gold, tortoise shell, which was very popular, and silver snuff boxes, which were very popular at 68 instances. This really reveals a picture to us of, of London's uh, material life. There is a prevalence of traditional and inexpensive and new and luxurious materials in this sample, and suggests men and women's appetite for and receptiveness for new luxury goods. In a sample taken from the proceedings of the same period, uh, 45 women had their snuff box stolen compared to 276 men. Only four had an occupation recorded, uh, two were kind of silversmiths or jewellers and the others were uh, pub keepers, they kept public houses. There was one unmarried woman and four widows, so lots of these cases are being brought by married women. 27 snuff boxes in this sample were made from 13 specified materials. The sample of female victims is therefore quite small to make many concrete comparisons of gendered snuff box ownership, other than two suggestive points. First, a considerably larger number of men had snuff boxes than women stolen. And a particularly gendered difference can explain why this happened. These snuff boxes were often designed to fit inside men's waistcoat pockets, whereas women's pockets are traditionally kept, well, were typically kept between inner and outer garments. So they were much more difficult to pick pockets from. Secondly, in both male and female uh, samples, gold, mother of pearl, tortoiseshell, and silver were the most popular snuff box material suggesting little gendering of snuff boxes, material medium or qualities themselves. Whilst historians have avidly debated the gendering of snuff and tobacco consumption, it's also important to remember that possession of a snuff box does not necessarily mean the owner was a snuffer and often they contain sweets, letters and other small things. Uh, none of the cases, it's interesting to know in the proceedings for men or women mentioned whether the snuff was contained inside, nor indeed its value. It was the snuff box that was of value to them. In this sample of men, there are 48 recorded occupations in 101 trials. 
These, and I'm calling them occupations, really it's kind of social position or ranking, comprehend the social strata of the 18th century social hierarchy, from the Earl of Mansfield to a farmhand. Unsurprisingly, the largest category was made up of merchants and dealers associated with the tobacco, snuff or toy trades, and they made up 24% um, of the total occupations listed. Excluding this group, 44 snuff boxes belong to noblemen, gentlemen, professionals, merchants and esquires, a broad mixture of men who could be categorised or elite or genteel or respectable. There was a similar level, though, of snuff box ownership between this group of men and those making up the lower middling sorts and what historians have sometimes called mechanics. 38 snuff boxes belong to those who can be grouped under the occupational categories of artisans or labourers, a wide and diverse group ranging from here, from a gilder to a pencil maker, coachman to a farmhand. Snuff box ownership in the sample was widespread across social groups relatively early in the 18th century. By 1720, six of the eight social groups had appeared in the sample. Interestingly, the two groups that were missing were noblemen and gentlemen, indicating that although not widespread in any significant number, ownership of snuff boxes occurred across the social divide early in the 18th century. By 1820, Snuffbox thefts were appearing in the proceedings across all social groups in greater numbers, and there was a parity between higher and lower social groups. So there was 11 in the kind of crudely defined higher social groups and 11 in the lower. Whilst possession of a snuffbox did not necessarily mark out social distinction, the social hierarchy was delineated in snuffbox's material form. Both higher and lower social groups recorded snuff boxes in a variety of material, and there is a noticeable, albeit unsurprising, difference. The aristocracy, the gentry, and professional men were much more likely to own a snuff box made from new or expensive materials, such as gold, tortoiseshell, or porcelain, than artisans and mechanics, whose snuff boxes were made from more traditional and inexpensive materials, such as base metals, horn, and leather. Snuff boxes were owned by men and women up and down the social hierarchy, but to preserve material and social distinction, they consumed snuff boxes made from luxurious and new materials to demarcate the social hierarchy. The intricately chased gold snuff box set the London's upper crust apart from the plebeian snuffer. And that the majority of snuffbox thefts took place in spaces such as brothels or taverns suggests that snuffboxes were used much more in spaces of all male sociability and conviv conviviality of kind of mixed social position. The sample of stolen canes and cane heads from the proceedings is significantly smaller. 93 trials included cane thefts in the proceedings between 1680 and 1820. Of these 93 thefts, 86 were for male victims and five were for women and two had no name recorded. No women had their profession or marital status recorded. And there is really quite difficult to find a kind of chronological um, pattern here. It peaks at unexpected times in the 1720s and 40s and then again in the 1780s and 90s. It, it's not clear why those peaks occur in my samples. There were 10 different cane head materials recorded in the sample. Gold was the most popular material with 19 gold heads recorded. The material that canes themselves were made from was never recorded. Although this can be attributed to the cost of gold, china, silver or ivory cane heads compared to a wooden component. Like the preceding snuffbox sample, cane heads were made from a variety of materials that fall into both traditional and inexpensive and new luxurious materials. 16 different occupations occur in the sample. Esquires are the most common victims of theft, followed by three nobles. So there were two baronets, Sir James Brown, Sir John Thomas, and then the Honourable Edward Stratford. These two social groups all had gold cane heads. 
However, most of these cane heads cost less than a pound and were most were valued between one and five shillings. Cane thefts in the proceedings therefore demonstrates that canes were objects particularly to do with demarcating social rank. Elite men were more likely to own canes and the canes were more likely to be made from precious metals. So again, materiality helping to, to demarcate the social hierarchy. Finally, toothpicks, which were by no means new to the 18th century. But the period did see the emergence of the toothpick case. The rise in personal grooming in a society that prized the body beautiful also meant an increase in Adam, uh, Alan Withy's words in the increase of material bodily ephemera used in the quotidian management of the body. And again, there is a much smaller sample of theft trials for toothpick cases, but it is still quite revealing, taken alongside canes and snuff boxes. Of the 23 trials between 1680 and 1820, 20 of the cases were bought by men and three by women. The sample is comparatively small alongside those of snuff boxes and canes. And as the toothpick cases were often valued between one and two shillings, this small sample size actually suggests that owners didn't suppress charges for the loss of property. Interestingly, the earliest trial to appear in the proceedings was brought by the king, George I, in 1725, against Claude Anjou for breaking into St. James's Palace and stealing a booty of jewels and accessories, including a toothpick case. Despite an infrequent presence in the proceedings, toothpick own ownership was widespread even in such a small sample, with a clergyman, an auctioneer, an undertaker, optician and publican, as well as the king possessing one. And there was a wide variety of materials recorded as well, gold, paper, ivory, silver, and tortoise shell. Again, suggesting that it's the material qualities of these that is setting distinctions but rather than their ownership. So I'm gonna move now into kind of a set of conclusions. So in thinking about masculine selfhood through these small, seemingly superfluous goods, the masculine self emerges as an increasingly reliant on things to be meaningful. Materiality was important in determining the contours of 18th century masculinity. Masculine material selfhood was therefore problematic to social conservatives because it was itself emergent and more widespread than ever before. To understand novelty and novelty culture, we now have to integrate questions and concerns around masculine material self-expression as it fundamentally underpins their concerns with luxury. That novelty and the new is hard to square with the pretense of masculinity as something eternal and increasingly biologically determined in the period. I think there is something really to do with a problem of kind of masculinity being grounded in the body as being grounded in something much more eternal and long lasting. And then this, this new and emergent goods that is adorning these men. While historians of masculinity now often approach it as an ongoing historically contingent process of identity formation, rather than a fixed relational category. The writers studied here promoted a masculinity that was in fix and in crisis for material deviance. Thinking about material selfhood through and with these objects, we can think of a gendered material selfhood as something that was also embodied, haptic and sensory. And therefore there was a huge capacity for the display of rational discernment to go wrong. Indeed, the languages and practices of tasteful consumption emerges precisely because the possession or ownership of once luxury goods was not enough to de denote refinement in a period of increased consumption, as the preceding data shows. What material your accessory was made from and how you used it was a key indicator of rank 
status and prestige. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ben, for that fascinating paper and um, for sharing your research with us. Um, we will now have um, a period of time for audience questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, you can do that in one of two ways. You can navigate down to the bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen where it says reactions and then choose raise hand and then I will invite you to speak. Or um, if you are unable to do that for whatever reason, you can put your question in the chat and I will be happy to read that out for Ben to answer. So while people are finding their way to asking some questions, I do have a couple and I'm sure Rembrandt might have some too. So my first question for you, Ben, would be, and it's a very specific, it's about a very specific object, the snuff box with the calendar mm. from the British Museum, which was fascinating. So the fact that it was the calendar for a specific year, does this suggest that they would re be replaced yearly, much like a pocket diary? So the sort of adding another layer to the idea of novelty, that it was by its very nature um, something that you could indeed replace continually. Yeah, um, it, that was the whole point of them. It, it, I think my guess is that they are seeing that this is happening with pocket diaries and they are thinking about what, how they could imitate, how kind of manufacturers and retailers could replicate that same kind of boom in the purchasing of, of pocket diaries. Um, there is there is limited material evidence. So the, that one from the British Museum is kind of one of the standouts. There's only a couple that are kind of earlier in the 1750s that survived. So maybe it didn't really take off. Um, but there is certainly a sense that it is there for that specific year and then will be gone. Mm. Are there any um, adverts for them, either sort of uh, written advertisements or any kind of? We, I have um, Trejant's, uh trade card where he says that he, um, he, is, he retails, he doesn't specifically say calendar snuff boxes, uh, but no, there isn't any kind of, not that I've been able to find any kind of yeah. advertisements. Um, readily available for these specifically. Fascinating. Thank you. Rembrandt. Yes, well, thank you very much. That was uh, indeed an exceedingly fascinating paper. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I certainly uh, wouldn't mind having some of these accessories myself, to be quite honest, <laughs> uh, whether that is masculine or not. Um, one question I had was uh, regarding that, I think that was the first steel advertisement that you showed about the snuff box um uh, i mean it's evidently the the advertisement implies that you can have sort of be erroneous in how you use the snuff box but it seems also to suggest in a slightly satirical way perhaps that you can also make deliberate communications in how you use the snuff box and, and how you pinch, pinch the snuff, etc. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that? Um, thank you. It, it's a great, it, it probably, I, I feel the more I read it and even reading it out at kind of papers, I, I really feel it is satirical um, more than anything else. Although Charles Lilly is a, a famous perfumer of the 18th century, is kind of one of the, the most kind of influential. Um, there is, I think there is a language around it. And I think that people were, it is what people find that kind of, because it is performative in a form of social mm. etiquette, it's what I think social, you know, these writers who are so obsessed with kind of men not being men anymore is, is that it is in, entirely performative. And, and But I think there is this way of um, direct communication with the actual taking of snuff itself and Will Tullett talks a little bit about this in his book about smell in the 18th century. Um, but, you know, snuff boxes were always part of systems of exchange. You know, my a longer version of this is, you know, they are nearly always diplomatic gifts. Um, they are always ways of these kind of mes um, messages of affection or of success. And I think there is, I don't think it's difficult to then build on that, that the, the way that taking snuff, had those same sorts of connections. 
Well, I, I thought in that context, indeed, the, the, the comparison that is made in the text with the, the female fan is particularly interesting because that's, of course, traditionally seen as a as a tool of communication, mm. basically, mm -hmm. apart mm. from a, a tool of uh, fanning. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, one, one wonders indeed, especially since you say said that uh, the, the, the consumption of snuff was also specific to mixed social uh, environments. Mm. So uh, what sort of messages could could indeed be conveyed subtly? Well, there's they say it's the, the surly and the scornful were, were two of the ones that kind of stand out. So the, you know, yes. the way of the way of, the way of taking um, too much, the way of rejecting, you know, maybe one of the specific ones that could really be is actually the refusal of the offer of snuff itself. The refusal. Yeah, you know, could be that there is there's something to do um also with the perfuming of the snuff itself. So mm. what you off what kind of snuff you offer to people. There's snuff kind of that is meant to be invigorating. There is snuff that um is meant to be kind of like a um aphrodisiac, um, which you might be able to use in those sorts of courtship situations, you know, they're retailed as such, um, different types of snuff. Um, but as well, just simply the way of taking it could could speak to i'm not sure about what specific ones but i think here is their idea that there potentially could be motions of the hand haptic motions that are being read as yeah. surly or scornful um or political and uh, yeah I, I won't dominate the uh, conversation but uh, uh, one more related question is is there any evidence that people had indeed more than one snuff box that they might use strategically in, in such settings, <laughs> offering a particular one with a particular type of content? Uh, yes. So I've talked today mostly about small ones, um, you mm -hmm. know, these kind of handheld ones, but there are lots of snuff boxes that were kept in dining rooms that were brought onto the table after right. dinner with port. Um, and so that is where kind of everyone is leaning into the table and all take, you know, their kind of um, sense of communal conviviality is because they are all reaching into the same, you know, much in the same way as they're reaching to the same port decanter. They are also consuming uh, the same snuff. Um, there are certainly people that own several, whether that is because they are collecting them. Uh, you know, and lots of them are simply dis displayed. You know, they are they're curios. Yeah. They are not. They are not um, simply always used. I know someone. There's one instance in the Old Bailey where someone uh, takes his kind of base metal snuff box out with him in his pocket and leaves his silver snuff box at home. So he has a kind of a snuff box that's appropriate. And, you know, he doesn't <laughs> mind that getting stolen or pickpocketed, whereas he wants to keep his good silver one at home. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, so this is probably, I'm sure this is a very difficult one um, to answer, but there seems to be a great tension um, between the satirical writings or the potentially satirical writings about these objects and the consumption of the object themselves so do we have any other kinds of records or anything which can kind of give an idea of what the public sentiment was about the objects was the satire um a particular sort of limited view of them because obviously people were still happily consuming these objects uh regardless of um supposedly "Quote unquote," potentially negative views of them. Um, yeah, yes, it's it is a core tension, and it's been a core tension that um, I think has been underexplored. I think that the the relationship between particularly ideas of gender and these objects has traditionally been written around these these things of luxury and effeminacy and the danger of these objects. And it really has obscured from our point of view what people actually felt about these objects. You know, a core question of my book is why did people consume so eagerly um, and so often 
when there was all of this debate going on. And so the the the, the conclusion you have to say is that it actually wasn't that influential. You know, these are writers who are writing for very limited. They are, the Spectator and Tatler has has wide publications, but they're speaking to a limited uh, number of politically leaning people. Uh, there is something to be said that they constantly talk about them. I mean, I have so many examples from these publications here, which it must be commercially viable that they are making those sorts of um, that they are making those sorts of criticisms. Um, so I turned to the old Bailey because I was like, how do we get to ordinary people? And, you know, in reality, ordinary people aren't caring about effeminacy and whether they are, you know, these refined people. They want something that is nice and will contain their snuff. Um, and I think I think in response, what people are doing is people are having nicer snuff boxes, because if everyone has one, how do I set myself apart? Um, and I think the proceedings points is there. Personalization, I look at a lot at um, ledgers of uh, silversmiths and jewelers. And, you know, these people are having messages inscribed on them. They're having their wives miniature, port the, you know, a miniature portrait that their wife has done is being put into a snuff box. These are, they're actually deeply personalized. I, I, I think I would really argue that lots of them are kind of uh, sold as semi-finished products that you buy a kind of a base snuff box and then you decorate it yourself. It's often, if you have any kind of heraldry, you'll have that all over the snuff box. And so actually, you know, the longer version of this research is actually thinking about personalization and kind of stamping, stamping yourself onto these objects. Um, but they're used in courtship. Um, they're often used um, in wills. So they're kind of a snuff box or a cane head or a ring or a seal is often given to male family members, passed down as kind of dynastic goods as well. These are not kind of trifling things, but kind of material symbols of uh, dynastic uh, masculine her um, heraldry. So there are lots more than just what these sources show, but this, those sources have been looked into much, much less by historians than the kind of, uh, you know, snide and, you know, um, satirical ones that are being done here. Thank you. Um, just before we turn to you, Rembrandt, um, we've had a, a question in the chat from Emily Taylor, and she asks, I'm wondering if Ben has looked at the purchasing and manufacturing places for these items. Were they particularly masculine? And did that have any impact on who bought them and the way they were used? Um, it's a great question. Um, they are lots of them are produced by men. Um, so Battersea Enamel is a really good example. So this is built, this is developed by a man called Theodore Janssen um, at Battersea House on, on the Thames. Um, and he basically is, is this, this part of this kind of innovation, this technological advancements that he's making in enamel wear. Um, he is also part of the Anti-Gallican Society, which is a society founded in the 1740s, which is trying to stop the import of French and German porcelain into Britain, hence Anti-Gallican. And what he's doing is trying to promote his own um, enamel wear. And lots of it is very plain. Uh, it's cream wear, so it's got very little kind of colour to it. It's this plain somber uh, material culture. And he's making lots of men's club societies, um, drinking uh, their drinking vessels, uh, plates, their snuff boxes for when they get together in taverns and in private dining rooms. And so actually what he is purposefully doing himself is to trying to promote or to not to promote, but actually to reframe these objects as not these kind of foreign, effeminate, uh, overly delicate things, but kind of stoic and British and manly and solid. And so actually he is one of these people churning out and trying to reframe and create a new consumer desire for objects that are, in his ideas, more manly. So actually, yeah, the places of production and manufacturing are really important to questions of gendering. Um, and, and 
it's very obvious from the source material that I've looked around the Anti-Gallican Society that that is it's purposeful. It's their intention uh, to do it in that way. I hope that has answered has answered your question concerning production. Great, thank you, uh, Rembrandt. Uh, yeah, another question I had is, um, I mean, in earlier periods that I'm more familiar with in the Renaissance, um, critique of novelty in fashion is often correlated with uh, religious sentiments. Uh, in in later periods that we know of from our, well closer to our own time, there is often a correlation with with political. Uh, opinions uh, with often novelty uh, being co correlated with sort of new or or um, uh, progressive uh, political views uh, and uh, uh, a stance against it with conservatism is is the, uh, either of these factors play a role in with these particular items in the 18th century? Um, yes. Is is the short answer? Um, funny enough, that there, there is some there is some religious discussion. I think here as well. Um, uh, there is one of the biggest. You know, now starting a project on the on, on the clergyman. There is a huge critique of clergymen smoking and consuming and snuffing tobacco and, and having this. And they apparently they're kind of renowned for being uh, snuffers. Is, is the word and you know there's this big problem that people face about the kind of you know uh the the supposed model that a clergyman is supposed to present to his parish of uh christian manly virtue and he is doing you know he is engaging in intoxicants many feel um, and so there is some religious dynamic about what's going on here not just simply kind of public morality or politics but actually about the kind of the role um, of religion in it. And, you know, a, a dist, you know, lots of um, Methodists and so on don't engage in cultures of intoxication, of which some of these objects that I'm talking about are. Um, and so there is definitely political discussions, uh, but it's two-handed. So lots of these debates on luxury are about political failures and trying to find explanations mm. of what those political failures are. And they conclude that men care more about their appearance than they do about winning wars or managing banks properly or governing the country. Um, and I think on the other hand, that these are really useful tools in diplomacy. They are often, as I said, diplomatic gifts. They're usually forms of um, kind of uh, soft power is we you know a way of describing them mm. so they are p key parts of the political culture there's some really good work i can't uh, carry love who's a who's just finished her phd at northampton has written about uh, political material culture in the 18th century you know there's a huge way that these objects are, are actually themselves embroiled in the practices of political culture in the 18th century as well 